morning. Welcome home. And uh, with Sabri's remarks, we are going to leave the floor to you. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, uh, thing to share or anything of that sort, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to use a presentation. Okay. Uh, in any case, I have uh, uh, assigned you as a co-host of this meeting as well. So just just in case, but yeah. okay. Okay. Sabri, if you uh, the floor is yours. Welcome home, Chandru, and welcome colleagues. Well. Um... Uh, it's our pleasure to host uh, C.P. Chandra Sekhar tonight, uh, an old friend, a uh, long-time colleague. Um, he taught uh, for more than three decades at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He is currently Senior Research Fellow at the Political Economy Research Institute, University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, he has published widely in academic journals and is the co-author of Crisis as conquest, conquest, learning from East Asia, the market that failed, neoliberal economic reforms in India, and demonetization decoded a critic of India's uh, currency experiment. He's a regular columnist for leading magazines and newspapers in India, and a founding executive committee member of International Development Economic Associates. As far as I remember, Erin is also um the founding member if not founding then uh, a committee member uh, of ideas um uh chandra's talk uh, will be on countries of the developing country debt crisis and the obstacles to resolution it's yours chandra thanks thank you um well what i intend to do uh briefly in this when initiating this um this discussion or in this lecture is really mm, to look at the fact that you know if you for example go to the towards the end of last last year the united nations had basically identified something like 54 developing countries which accounted for a very large proportion of the world's poorest population as being in a situation where they were either in debt stress or mm, on the verge of default or had defaulted and uh, Really, uh, this was this was crucial, but uh, not merely because of the fact that this has implications for the populations resident in these countries, but also because it basically undermines the ability of the of the of the world system uh, to be able to ensure uh, a host of things, including expenditures required to deal with the shocks like the pandemic was, uh, with adequate expenditures on health, for example, and more importantly, to deal with the, uh, what everybody recognizes now is the principal challenge as, as it were, or at least one of the principal challenges, which is uh, undertaking expenditures on mitigation, but at least in those countries, uh, undertaking expenditures on adaptation and trying to um, address losses which come as a result of loss and damage associated with the climate change. So, uh, so there was there's a sort of consensus that we must find a way to resolve a situation in which there is this deep debt stress across developing countries. But if we look at the evidence, it actually seems to be that it's extremely difficult to, uh, or it's proving extremely difficult in practice to resolve these uh, resolve debt stress and even debt crisis. I mean, for example. Um, Zambia defaulted was one of the first countries after the um, after the COVID pandemic to default in 2020, and Zambia has still not gone through a complete resolution of of uh, in terms of rescheduling or restructuring its debt. Uh, similarly, we have other countries, uh, for example, you know, Ghana and Ethiopia and Africa. The one country which see, which has managed in some sense ostensibly to get into a trajectory in which it is on a path towards debt restructuring and resolution is supposed to be Sri Lanka. And the only reason which uh, in for identifying Sri Lanka as a country which has been through uh, or is on the trajectory to resolution is because of the fact that it is the one it is one one of the countries which has managed to actually ensure that it gets an agreement with the IMF subject of course to uh, certain conditions and uh, that uh, getting and 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 that this is seen as being the first step um, yeah, in in resolution even though relative to the uh, 50 odd billion of uh, uh, sri lanka's debt the amount of uh, money which is going to be given over something like a 36 to 48 month period by the imf a 36 month period is really merely 2.9 billion dollars so 
The amount of money which the IMF is giving is extremely small relative to the total amount of debt which has to be resolved. More importantly, relative to the payments which Sri Lanka would have to make on this external debt over the coming one or two or three years. And therefore, per se, this is not the resolution. But as it were, the fact that it has gone through, uh, uh, I mean, that that actually it has got, got board clearance from, from the IMF for its 2.9 billion uh, extended fund facility loan, uh, it is seen as one country which has actually begun the process of debt restructuring. Now, what, what I want to sort of focus on is really uh, the, the following. We know that you know debt in developing countries is, is, is an old problem. It's an old problem essentially because of the fact that these were countries which, uh, as a result of the way in which the international order, economic order evolved ever since the Industrial Revolution, were at the losing end of global trade. Uh, many of them were uh, producers of uh, primary products or traditional manufacturers. Even when they actually diversified to a certain extent into production of certain kinds of other manufacturers, they were uh, yeah, sort of embedded in value chains where the domestic value added associated with that production was relatively low. So the ability, they, they were in a position where the ability, even after taking into account the uh, receipts they got, the foreign exchange receipts that they got from, um, from areas like uh, remittances of workers resident abroad, from uh, tourism receipts, and of course, from receipts from the export earnings, uh, it was clear that uh, they were not in a position to be able to finance many of the import demands which were coming from their populations for consumption and productive investment. And particularly because of the fact that these were countries, most of these were countries with a significant degree of income inequality, which essentially meant that there existed a section of the population which was constantly uh, pushing, putting pressure on governments to allow them to undertake foreign exchange expenditures to meet what could be considered inessential consumption or luxury consumption of one kind or another. But basically, we had this situation where these were countries ever since the Second World War, when this kind of a discussion, or in fact, ever since the, the Great Depression, um, when this kind of discussion about development began, these were countries which were essentially identified as being vulnerable in terms of, um, of constantly being in a situation of balance of payments difficulty, not necessarily of being in, in debt stress. Now, the reason why countries which were in balance of payments difficulties for a certain period of time were not countries which necessarily were always in debt stress was because of the fact that, you know, at till, till about the 1970s, uh, the recycling of surpluses, balance of pay payment surpluses from the rich countries which had those surpluses to the poor countries which were vulnerable and, had and, and were recording deficits essentially occurred either through foreign direct investment or through the development aid network, which essentially was either bilateral aid or multilateral aid, which was being provided to these countries. Now, if you take these flows, I mean, meaning what I'm trying to say is that that that, that was a period going up to the 1970s when the private financial system, including the international commercial banking system, was unwilling to take risks in terms of lending to these countries because they were considered to be risky in multiple senses. There was political risk because governments could change and they could repudiate debt. There was economic risk because these are vulnerable countries and might not be in a position to be able to earn the foreign exchange to service their external debt. And of course, there was an exchange rate risk if you actually tried to lend to these countries in, in, in terms of their domestic currencies, because you would end up with a situation where the depreciation of that currency would make it difficult for these for you to be able to 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 retrieve uh, your, your 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 dollar liability. So in essence, uh, you had a situation where, as I said, the the flow is the flow came from from uh, from uh, either from foreign direct investment or it came from the development aid network, bilateral and multilateral aid. Now, these were all supply side determined. Whether a foreign investor undertook investment in a developing country or not was a decision taken by the foreign investor for whatever be the considerations that investor might have. Whether a bilateral donor was going to provide money to a country very often depended upon the strategic relationship which the donor country had, or not donor, lender country had with the borrower country. And very often the flows were determined by which were the countries which were in some sense colonies of, of so you know 
you know, the, the, the European imperial masters lent to their ex-colonies, Britain lent to its ex-colonies, etc. And finally, of course, if you look at how the flow of multilateral aid, that there was a limited flow of multilateral aid, and this multilateral aid too was in some sense allocated based on political considerations. Uh, so therefore, it, so therefore, if you if you if, if if you were a country which was vulnerable, and you ran into balance of payments difficulties, and decided that you were going to you 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 were going to you know allow these difficulties to to continue such that your current account deficit widened, necessitating financing in foreign exchange from abroad, you had to go to a supply side determined network, and whether you got that money or not depended upon the decision of the supply side actors. And if they were not willing to provide you adequate amount of money, it meant that you actually saw a collapse of reserves, a balance of payments uh, crisis, forced uh, turn to the IMF for emergency financing. And that ended up in a situation when you had to curtail your growth, curtail your demand for foreign exchange, curtail your imports, and therefore your demand for foreign exchange in order to be able to tailor what you had, what, 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 what you were spending to what you had or what you were receiving. So this essentially meant that that as a developing country, you had one of two choices. Either you chose to try and get yourself to dealing, to get yourself a certain degree of independence from international markets, dependence on imports and dependence on foreign, foreign capital, which involved servicing in foreign exchange. Or you basically said that, listen, I, I might be slightly open, but if I'm open, I'm going to condemn myself to be running at a relatively low level equilibrium because there is a limit to the amount of foreign exchange I could access to finance any current account deficit that I might incur. So the idea was that you virtually you sort of prune your, your, your growth in order to be able to be relatively balance of stable, payment stable because of the fact that there were limits to what you could get. Now, we know that this changed after the 1970s, and this changed after the 1970s for reasons I'm not going to, to go into in detail, but it essentially was because of a significant buildup of liquidity in the international system. One, of course, because of the oil shocks and the fact that the oil surpluses, export surpluses were in substantial measure deposited in the international financial system. And two, of course, because of the fact that the United States be began to behave despite its loss of competitiveness in trade, began to behave as a country which did not have a national budget constraint because of the fact that it was home to the reserve currency. So it virtually, you know, behaved like, uh, as, as Stuben said, that it had a mint in its backyard, printed dollars to undertake, uh, to, to generate uh, uh, money to be able to pay for its its trade in, 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 deficit, in current account deficits, to pay, to, to provide money to its its investors who went abroad and continue to invest. And of course, to find the money to be able to police the world and engage, say, in the Vietnam War. So in all of these senses, you had a huge you know, accumulation of dollar surpluses in the international system. You had euro dollar market, yen dollar market, etc. So you had this sudden buildup of international liquidity, partly because of the oil shocks and partly because of, of uh, what the, when the United States was doing and some other causes, which I'm not going to go into now. Now, if you have that kind of liquidity in the international system, which partly goes and settles in the international financial system, particularly the international banking system at that point of time, banks cannot sit on, on, the, on, on their deposits. They have to keep the money moving, moving to the extent that they pay an interest rate. They need to actually take this money and, and earn a return such that they can get a spread between what they pay the depositors and what they get from their borrowers and you know from, from, from the investments they make. And after adjusting for intermediation costs, they get a profit. If they don't keep the money moving, they'll actually begin to make losses. So suddenly there was a push within the international financial system to find new lenders. Of course, you can find new lenders in the developed countries themselves, which you did. You suddenly saw a, a boom in, in, in credit in the developed countries. But if you have a boom in credit in the developed countries, that results well, till such time as the boom lasts, uh, as the 2008 crisis pointed out, that results in an increase in demand. To the extent that there's an increase in demand, there's growth. To the extent that there's growth in countries which are energy intensive in terms of their consumption and production, the demand for oil increases. To the extent that the demand for oil increases, the surpluses of the oil producers increase. And to the extent that the surpluses of oil producers increase, it goes back into the international financial system. So you had to find new areas, new, new, new locations to invest in, new, new, you know, people to lend to. And 
In some sense, it was at this point of time that the discovery of the so-called emerging markets and subsequently, of course, the frontier markets, uh, which were even poorer countries, suddenly countries which the international private fin international financial system was not willing to, to risk capital in became, uh, you know, extremely, you know, attractive destinations because they were not exposed to these destinations. They had, had not lent to them in the past because they were risky. But now they were suddenly became attractive destinations because there was no exposure to these countries. And so we began to see a significant flow or at least a willingness of capital to flow as debt and, 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 and non uh, FDI investment, portfolio investment in, into many of these countries, including into bond markets, etc. Now, this obviously made thing made li life easier for vulnerable countries, which hadn't been in a situation which where they saw the international economic order changing. I mean, there were exceptions. I mean, there was a South Korea, there were Taiwan, but basically there were very few exceptions of countries which made a transition from after the Second World War from being you know, backward countries to becoming advanced countries. In fact, there are only two, which is South Korea and Taiwan, if you leave out the two city-states, you know, which is Hong Kong and Singapore, because the so-called second-tier East Asian industrializers didn't, couldn't sustain that, that process for long enough for them to make the transition from, from being less developed countries to being developed countries. So you basically had a situation where these, these countries, which hadn't seen the structural diversification that needed to reduce their vulnerability, beginning to, to, in some sense, um, uh, suddenly having access to international liquidity, to foreign exchange. And therefore, they decided all, you began to see the wave of liberalization. Very often, it is suggested that trade liberalization came first and financial liberalization came, came later. But trade liberalization could not have occurred but for the fact that there was access to finance, to access which you had to financially liberalize to differing degrees. Of course, starting with debt, because if you if you liberalize trade, your import bill not automatically went up. It took time, even if you are successful, to actually increase your exports, because exports are a function of time. You need to build goodwill, and goodwill is a function of time. If you even if you're going to be successful, so there would be a period the moment you liberalize trade, you would actually end up with a situation where you'll have an increase in your trade and current account deficits, which essentially means. That if you were in the old world where everything was determined only from the supply side and you couldn't pick up your telephone and call whatever, New York or, or London or the city of London and say, listen, I want $2 billion and somebody syndicates a loan for you or somebody says, OK, we'll buy into your sovereign bonds or whatever it may be uh, or commercial banks uh, you know, provide you a loan, that you end up with a situation in which you suddenly think that, listen, I have an opportunity now. And therefore, all of these countries liberalized because they had access to the finance to be able to liberalize. Okay. Now, this, 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 this went on in a way in which we saw, you know, fluctuations. There were periods in which there was large flows, and you know, right from the beginning, right from 1982, the Mexican debt crisis. We've always seen debt crisis in developing countries. Some of these crises went to, were in countries which it became clear at one point of time that there was no way that they could even restructure or resolve this debt. Which was why, between the mid 1990s and mid 2000s, you had two major initiatives: the 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 highly indebted poor countries the HIPC initiative, and subsequently the multilateral debt relief initiative. And what you actually saw was many countries, particularly poor countries in Africa, saw a significant fall in the total stock of debt that they held because of the debt forgiveness which came. Not because that the World Bank and the IMF used their money to settle this, but because of the fact that you created versions of trust funds into which developed country donors put money such that these countries could, could be given money to write off debt in essence. Because what you were trying to do in part, starting from the Brady bonds, what you're trying to do is to save the private financial sector in the developed countries using public resources, at least in the case of the most difficult uh, uh, you know, debtor, debtor situations or debtor default situations. Now, what we're having today is that what we are seeing is that, I mean, despite the MDRI, despite the HIPC initiative, we are back again in the same world, where it's not only some middle-income countries which have accumulated large debt, but there are a large number of poor countries which have accumulated large debt. And the point is a number of these countries you know, have debt which has taken on a completely new structure, which makes it difficult to, to resolve. 
Now, why did this debt come back again? This debt come, came back again because you haven't, you, we haven't resolved the fundamental vulnerability, the fund, fundamental inequality of a world system, which doesn't allow you to diversify such that you don't have these deep imbalances between balance of payment surpluses concentrated in a few countries and balance of payments deficits concentrated or, or prevalent in a large number of countries. Okay. So therefore, you're going to get you're going to get get debt, debt accumulating over a period of time if you allow these countries to keep those kinds of deficits going because they can access international finance and the reason they can access international finance is because there's an international financial community which wants new destinations to lend to to invest in now that 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 desire of yield seeking capital to go into developing countries obviously increased hugely after the 2008 crisis when when the developed country central banks decided to inject huge amounts of liquidity into their financial systems in order to be able to save the banks, in order to be able to, to a certain extent, revive economies by generating a new, new credit-fueled uh, sort of recovery uh, and so on. And the result was before the COVID, COVID pandemic or the COVID crisis, if you want to call it that, you essentially had a situation where if you take, for example, the the uh, the uh, the uh, U.S. Fed, the U.S. Fed's balance sheet we know went up from something like eight hundred billion dollars to about four point five trillion dollars between two thousand eight and uh, something like two thousand thirteen two thousand fourteen, and then of course came the COVID pandemic when you began to in inject even more money into the system as a way because the only solutions you had to deal with macroeconomic imbalance in the developed countries was not fiscal policy. You use fiscal policy to an extent, but principally monetary policy, so-called unconventional monetary policies, which was to infuse, to cut interest rates to near zero and infuse large amount of cheap capital into the system in the hope that this would generate some kind of a recovery in the metropolitan core. Well, it didn't necessarily give you too much of a recovery in the metropolitan core, but what it did was it provided new sources of capital to the financial speculators who went into developing countries and offered more credit. Now, this, this has resulted in a situation where this, together with some other change, which I'll mention in a minute, changed the structure of, 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 of debt in the developing countries. The first thing it did was that it actually began to result in a situation where a tendency which was visible right from the 1980s, which was for the share of private financial flows to developing countries and total financial flows to rise over a period of time because, because private flows were increasing. And of course, you had the problem of aid fatigue, so-called fatigue. This was not fatigue. They just decided that they don't want to put any more money there, that, that you actually had you know, both you know, bilateral and multilateral credit from from the developed country capital, the market economy donors, including through the Paris Club, really you not know, drying up, but but shrinking in considerable measure, and uh, therefore you you know you didn't have that kind of capital moving in in large measure. So you had private capital, uh, which was of course taking up a larger and larger share. But what happened was that in the starting from particularly the two thousands, you had one country which not merely was accumulating balance of payment surpluses, but for multiple reasons to access resources, to accept uh, ac access uh, raw materials, minerals, uh, food grains, whatever it may be. And as well as for strategic reasons, decided that it needs to actually put a lot of money into developing countries. And that was China. So the first thing which happened is, of course you had a huge increase in the share of private flows to total flows. But within official flows, the share of, the, of China in the total bilateral credit flow in, began to increase considerably. Okay? And the third change which was occurring is that, that because it was, it was increasingly a fragmented global financial system, which was, trying, which, which was actually ho host to this yield-seeking capital, you began to see in, you know, an important role for private bondholders in debt to developing countries. And many, most often this took the form of sovereign debt. Okay. Uh, so you actually had m many of these countries. I mean, Sri Lanka has a large volume of sovereign debt maybe issued, uh, sovereign bonds issued. Ghana has issued significant amount of so sovereign bonds, etc. So you, you basically have many of these countries are facing debt stress, actually, actually having 
have, having a large number of private bondholders holding a significant share of their total private credit, not just the commercial banks. Commercial banks are there too. But we know that the more fragmented the creditor community, the more difficult it becomes to resolve debt because you'll always have holdouts. You'll always have some people saying that, listen, no, we are not willing to take a haircut, even though we know that this is not a resolvable situation. Now, in this, in this context, what, what actually happened is that the, 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 in, the by Bretton Woods institutions and their backers, which is the with the market economy developed countries, have obviously decided to try and change the discourse with regard to debt restructuring. How are they changing the discourse? You know, earlier what used to happen, as I mentioned, is supposing a country ran into balance of payments difficulties, debt distress, debt default, whatever it may be, it went to the IMF. And then it negotiated with the IMF and then the IMF, it, it actually presented a, a so-called letter of intent because it's supposed to own these policies, describing the policies that it would undertake in return for getting a certain amount of funding from the IMF. But if you look at it now, the first thing which is happening when these large number of developing countries are facing debt, debt distress is that the IMF firstly holds out till the very last moment till they really are in bad shape. I mean, there are some exceptions. Bangladesh, you know, somehow got for itself uh, uh, an early loan. But in most cases, you know, you, you don't have debt, you know, in the IMF coming in early. Secondly, when the IMF comes in, it, it begins to send its staff teams. Now, when the staff teams are there, you still don't have an agreement. But while the staff teams are going through their visit one, visit two, maybe, you suddenly see these countries adopting all the policies which normally they would adopt after having entered into an IMF agreement. What do they do? They increase energy prices because energy prices have to be market determined and they shouldn't be fuel sub subsidies. They, they, they curtail food subsidies. They, they say that we have to move from, you know, from being primary deficit countries, that is, you know, before interest, you're looking at the, the deficit before interest. Uh, the from being primary deficit countries to being primary surplus countries. They want to make that transition, which means a huge contraction because where are they going to tax in a situation in which you're down in, in you know, when, when your GDP is, is shrinking, okay? And so, so you basically have the same set of policies, but these are policies now being adopted before the IMF law, okay? Then once they've said that, oh, we need to do this in order to be able to get the IMF to give, give us a loan, because if the IMF does not give us a loan, then, you know, we are not going to be able to restructure debt. Okay. So the IMF then says that, okay, now you're behaving yourself. We'll first have a staff agreement. So the staff, there's a staff agreement, which then says that we will give you so much money subject to you adopting the following, you know, that this is the, what, what they have a sort of debt sustainability, a DSA, a debt sustainability assessment that in some sense projects, all sorts of things, what's going to be your, your budgetary position, what's going to be a foreign exchange position, what's going to be a debt GDP ratio, what's going to be your external debt GDP ratio, et cetera. And then they say that to be to attain this, we'll give you a bridge loan. As I said, I mean, you know, you get $2.9 uh, $9 billion when you're sitting on something like $57 billion of debt to be restructured. That's just a bridge, okay? But the understanding is that the IMF I'm, I, if the IMF doesn't give you a bridge, restructuring will, 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 will just not occur, okay? Now, the IMF then gives you this bridge, but it also says that, listen, not only will we give you this bridge, when we are giving you this bridge, we'll bring the other multilaterals in. So the World Bank will come in, the ADB will come in, give some additional amount of money. So maybe your 2.9 billion becomes something like 7 billion over a period of you know 48 months or you know 60 months because they also make some promises of what they'll give subject to you arriving at an IMF agreement. Now, having got so far and having a staff level agreement, again, the scenario changes. You don't immediately get your money because the IMF then would say that, listen, you please go to your bilateral creditors and get financing assurances from them that they would be willing to take a haircut, which is in keeping with the requirements of my debt sustainability initiative. Okay. Now, why only bilateral creditors? One, of course, is you're not going to get an agreement to start with from multilateral, I mean, I'm sorry, from private creditors, including these board holders. So in any case, you're trying to protect them in terms of reducing the haircut they'll have to take in a very difficult situation. 
to the bank, the World Bank, the ADB, etc., do not accept haircuts because they think that they argue that this will affect their preferred creditor status, their AAA, tra AAA ratings. Now, where does their AAA ratings come from? It comes from the fact that they have an implicit sovereign bank backing of all the countries which are member states of the organization. Okay, because there's an implicit backing that for the World Bank that the the US, the EU, uh, the UK, the Japan, etc., besides other members, will not let the uh, the World Bank collapse. They're not going to let the World Bank collapse. So there is a there is an implicit guarantee that you're going to be okay. So even if you lose a little bit of money, two. They get a, they get they get their AAA ratings also because of the fact that those who are borrowing from them are borrowing under treaty. They are members of these institutions by treaty, so they cannot default on loans that they take from them. So it really is that if at all there's going to be a haircut, it's because of the fact that the World Bank says that listen, we are willing to give you a haircut because we think that that's the best way you can move forward, which is a kind of debt forgiveness in which they are parties. But they say no, if we do this. We lose our AAA ratings, we lose our preferred creditor status, and we won't be able to go, go and borrow at kinds of rates of interest which will help developing countries. So fine, you cannot have a restructuring in which the private creditors come in. You cannot have the multilateral, you know, MDBs, the multilateral development banks, like the World Bank and ADBs giving you a, a reduction in credit. And you need assurances from the bilateral creditors. Now, who is the most important bilateral creditor in most cases? It is China. So the whole idea is China should take a significant haircut in its bilateral debt in order for, 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 it, for, for the country to be in a position where there is some indication that it can actually move along that debt sustainability assessment curve. And once that is there, it is argued that the private creditors would be willing to take some haircuts and, and, and you can resolve your debt. Now, it is not that China shouldn't take a haircut. But two things. Why? Should, why? Because of the fact that China, after, after the years of so-called aid fatigue, because China has become an important bilateral donor, why should it carry the responsibility of resolving all of this debt? It's part of a multilateral initiative in which the IMF sits at the core. So the the... I mean, China has made two kinds of points. One is it says that, listen, we, we are willing to bilaterally negotiate with our with our borrowers and we'll, 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 we'll try and settle our part of the debt. Why should we be party to an arrangement which actually is the IMF trying to reduce the haircut which private financial capital is going to take? And two, China is basically making the point that, listen, why should the World Bank not take a haircut? Why should the ADB not take a haircut? They should be part of the common framework, the so-called G20 common framework, where everybody is supposed to share, share, share a responsibility for, for resolving debt. Now, this, this, this situation has been converted into a discourse in which it is presented as if China is really the villain of the piece. It is because China is unwilling to come to the table. It's because China is not willing to be part of the common framework that we are ending up in a situation where resolution doesn't occur. The reason resolution doesn't occur, on the contrary, is because of the fact that without, without actually getting to really make significant concessions yourself and looking to help your own private capital, not in the old form of the Brady bonds and so on, but in a new form in which bilateral creditors, in particular China, carries the cam, you really want a, want a process of resolution, which obviously is, is proving difficult to get. Finally, supposing, supposing it so happens that China does actually accept this common framework, accept IMF conditionality prior to and post the IMF giving the loan, we still would have two problems. The first problem we would have is that you still will have to go to those private creditors and restructure private debt, which basically means the private creditors will have to take a significant uh, significant um, haircut. And we know that there'll always be holdouts. We know in the case of, um, of, uh, of uh, Sri Lanka, already one major private creditor has gone to court in New York saying that we, 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 we won't accept any, any, any haircut at all. I mean, this is the, the Hamilton Reserve Bank. Uh, it's not a reserve bank, that's, that's the name of the bank. Okay, the second reason why you're not going to actually have a resolution is because of the fact that once you're on an IMF type austerity restructuring trajectory, your deep GDP is going to shrink. 
if your GDP shrinks, how could you generate the kind of, 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 of uh, payments even after all the austerity? How, how are you actually going to generate the kind of surpluses need to clear even the reduced debt? And how are you going to meet all of these targets in full, which the IMF sets, which every six months it will check whether you're, whether you're meeting those targets and you would actually end up with a situation where if you're not, you won't get the next trash. So in some sense, it is this changed environment and the, in some sense, the ganging up of a set of creditors in favor of private finance against one major bilateral creditor, I would argue, that, that has resulted in a situation where this, this debt, these, this, this set of contours of the way in which debt has evolved, restructuring has become extremely difficult. And it is true that you, this, this goes to the extent of saying that in Sri Lanka's case, oh, India is willing to, 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 to restructure debt, Japan is willing to restructure debt. But Japan and India, are really, first of course, India is not a major creditor to in many other contexts. It's a creditor to, to a certain extent to Nepal, to Sri Lanka, to, to Maldives, etc., not across the world. And to, um, I mean, they, they are doing it because of the fact that they see themselves as part of the pact, part of the alliance in this geopolitical, geostrategic game in which China is the one country on the other side, of course, now possibly with some kind of an alliance with Russia. It's this environment which makes it impossible, at least at the moment, for us to be able to, to um, to get a resolution of this crisis, which is urgently needed. And really, you know, looking at things like the G20 com common framework as a step forward is not to understand the complexity of the situation. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, while you were speaking, Belman joined. Um, so we are seven now. Um, Any questions? I have lots, but let me uh, <laughs> let other people ask any questions first. This is an area that I am very interested in, as you know. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyone? Perhaps you should go ahead, Sabre, while Sinan is uh, joining us. Uh, I am sure he will... Uh, up questions as well, but uh, why don't you start the floor? Okay. Um, one thing that we uh, know, Chandra, <clears throat> is the fact that although World Bank is called a bank, it is actually not a bank. As mm -hmm. you were saying, uh, it borrows from the market to fund the credits it extends to the developing countries or whoever borrows from it. Uh, on the other hand, IMF, because it has the ability to create SDRs, is actually a bank. And can, <laughs> consequently, it can extend uh, credit to the country simply by creating the SDRs, which then they can later use to pay their debt by the IMF created SDRs. Um, why, uh, especially the US, uh, doesn't want uh, IMF to provide those SDRs to the uh, indebted developing countries so that the private debtors are, are going to be saved actually, not the borrowers as you know. Uh, why is the uh, US and other uh, big countries such as Germany and uh, I don't know, France, maybe UK, uh, do not agree with uh, this and do something about um, IMF uh, SDR creation? Um, since you are in this uh, and watch it quite closely, maybe you know what the discussions are. Yeah, well, I completely, completely true. If you can put cheap liquidity into the system, which goes also to developing countries, okay. So we need to, we need two components of it. Say we had one round of it, you know, six six fifty billion SDR or six fifty billion dollar equivalent SDR provided to uh, 
to our countries and uh, of course the majority of it goes because it's quota linked it goes to the developed countries but we can have some countries saying that we'll like japan has done that we'll uh, transfer some of this at at the sdr interest rate now why why isn't this isn't this being done one one of course if i think one is that there is um, there is uh, an an understanding that you know putting liquidity into the system is making it easy for everybody so the united states might not want i don't know might not want iran to have access to sdrs might not want um, you know russia to have access to sdrs beyond a point up to a point they might go but basically the whole idea would be that uh, that um, that it might have it might it might say that listen i might be wanting to help some help some of my private you know private uh, financial interests and in the process appear to be helping some poor countries but in the process i might end, end up helping a set of people uh, or a set of nations which i don't want to help uh, or who in my view would misuse it uh, to fight a war or whatever it may be so so therefore uh, that's one that's the first thing that that and i believe china is also a, a major issue yeah yeah yeah, yeah sure Western... but you know the point is i suppose china doesn't need the sdrs to I mean, it has enough surpluses at the moment so it's not going to go and use the sdrs at the moment the second the second thing is is i think that the you know that there is a you know we know that up to up to 650 billion it doesn't have to go to congress you know so if you keep putting out this thing at some point of time congress is going to say that is you can you can't actually take a decision with regard to the you know as being a as being a veto holding you know uh, stakeholder in the imf take decisions about the imf being willing to do this internationally without coming to us and that particularly given the fact of the, you know very right wing republican hawks sitting in congress might actually be a point that you 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 can do it once and get away with it um, of course there are people i mean there are civil society organizations etc trying to and 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 democrats you know the radical democratic caucus and so on trying to actually say that you, you we wanted to come to congress and we'll get it passed through congress but i'm not so sure it's going to be so easy but uh, the point is you up to a point you don't need congress clearance but if you keep trying to do that in little slots so, so that congress is kept out that is also going to create a problem for you politically in the united states the third thing of course is that you know i increasingly we should be we should be uh, we should also realize that you know doing it this way because because after all all there is a political economy here being being in a position to resolve debt according to your terms as opposed to just giving cheap liquidity to these countries mean, means that your leverage goes your leverage goes about the kind of policies you have to adopt your leverage goes into in terms of the kind of uh, you know liberalization they want your leverage goes in terms of this your kind of strategic alliances you you enter into don't enter into and you want that leverage so why would you beyond a point keep giving money which actually takes away leverage from you because you've used this leverage historically on multiple occasions to mm-hmm. actually try and push, push a certain agenda and to top it all even from the point of view of the developing countries it's going to become i mean it's still very very attractive it's, it's still, you know having more and more access to sdr but it's going to become little less attra- attractive because of the fact that the sdr interest rate is the weighted average interest rate of benchmark rates in the countries which are the you know the prime countries as in you know in terms of reserve currencies of course mm-hmm. including china and what we are seeing is that we are on a trajectory we don't know if that's going to change but it's a trajectory in which interest rates benchmark interest rates are going up so the sdr which had a very low interest rate would begin to see a higher and higher interest rate associated with it correct it was it would, still, it would be still much lower than what developing countries will have to pay if they're going to borrow in the market mm-hmm. but the point is it might not be enough for the poorest countries who might actually need straightforward grants to be in a position to for them to be able to get out of the, of the crisis that they are in Yeah. Um okay. Um I have other questions but let me give priority to uh well Sinan is going to ask a question apparently. Go ahead Sinan. Thank you. Thank you professor. Uh 
Professor, uh, thank you very much for this uh, comprehensive presentation, uh, first of all. Honestly, uh, I have a, a few questions, as Erin Ojam said. Uh, let me ask you step by step. Uh, my first question is, uh, from what you have said, uh, I understand that uh, there are two major problems uh, facing the world economy today. Uh, the first uh, is uh, shrinking liquidity. And the second one is a uh, burden created by uh, debts uh, of developing countries, uh, which are uh, mostly given at uh, variable uh, interest rates. Uh, since Mexican crisis uh, broke out uh, for exactly these uh, reasons and mechanisms, uh, under these conditions, uh, can we say that uh, a new debt crisis is waiting for the world? Uh, if so, how feasible do you think uh, that relief uh, that relief is? You know, uh, I would say that you know even before the increases in interest rates began, the debt crisis had already arrived. The debt crisis arrived the moment you actually had a huge accumulation of debt, which occurred before the COVID pandemic. And that huge occurred because of the injection of cheap liquidity into the international system, <laughs> which found its way to all of these markets, including the frontier markets. So therefore, you had unsustainable debt already. Okay, Then you had the COVID shock, which meant that you know tourism receipts fell, trade could not take place, exports were down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, all of that. Remittances were lower and so on. And therefore, you know unsustainable debt became even more unsustainable. And then, of course, finally, because the international speculators decided to use the Ukraine war to speculate in oil and food markets, you saw this increase in food and fuel prices. And that obviously made it for those countries like Sri Lanka, for example, or many other African countries, which are dependent on imports of these of these food and, food and fuel. You know, so, so the way I'd look at it, the crisis was already there. And then now on top of the pan, so you had the crisis, which was brewing. Then you had the pandemic. Then you had the food and fuel price inflation, and now you have the increase in interest rates. So, I mean, I I think the situation is is very very different from Mexico nineteen eighty two, or nineteen ninety. It's very different. Um, Sinan, we'll continue, but I would like to uh, say something. Yeah, go ahead. This this that is unpayable. If they do not uh, um, take a huge haircut, they are not going to get any. Why are they insisting? I mean, um, the defaults already started, right? With Zambia and others will stop servicing their debt. Uh, maybe some already stopped. I don't know huh, how many. Zambia has already stopped. Mm. But, yeah, but the point is, but the point is, you know, that the thing is not about whether you take an haircut or not. The thing is that who is going to take how much of the haircut? Because you, you're basically not saying it has to be an equal haircut across all, all creditors. Yeah, but I mean, if World Bank and ADB says zero, uh, you know, the, the private creditors, some of them are saying zero, some other, some other saying, you know, because if you look at it, you know. If you look at what these bonds are trading in market, they are they are trading at something like forty cents to the dollar. Yeah. So it, it, if if normally they should take a sixty percent haircut, but they are basically saying that we won't take a sixty percent haircut because they are hoping that somebody else like China would take a big haircut so that they they can get it at they can get seventy cents to the dollar or eighty cents to the dollar. Yeah, I understand all of these. So but... it's, it's it's really it's really a fight over the burden distribution of the burden of the haircut. Yeah, but the debts will cancel themselves by not being service, right? But that is that is the nature of capitalism, isn't it? That's how crisis occurs. <laughs> and if you have a system of atomistic decision makers, each pursuing his or her interest, then, then what you get is crisis. I mean, you know. Sure. Okay. Um, back to Sinan. Uh, professor, I think nevertheless, uh, in this case, uh, we can say that uh, this current crisis was created on purpose, actually, with these interest rate hikes. Uh, it's uh, only my opinion. I know maybe I am wrong. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I think so. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, bilateral loans mainly given uh, by China. Uh, today, uh, we observed that uh, China has uh, given loans to many countries uh, for various projects, uh, for example, uh, related to uh, Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, mostly uh, to position the renminbi as an alternative currency in the world uh, against US dollar. Uh, uh, as you said, uh, for example, Sri Lanka or Montenegro, uh, Djibouti, uh, it's discussed how much uh, China uh, 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 all, uh, take over uh, ports and highways due to unpaid debts. Uh, at this point, uh, do you think uh, China has created some kind of debt trap uh, within the scope of uh, sovereign debt uh, debate? Parallel to uh, the argument that uh, these uh, debts are not uh, given rationally. Uh, if so, uh, can we think uh, these debts uh, are uh, unsustainable uh, for China as a uh, as a, cre a, cre a credit a credit uh, creditor a cre cre creditor creditor yeah, Cred I, I'm, I'm, I must I must say I completely I, I completely disagree with that kind of a view because I think that this is the propaganda of the of the Western uh, uh, the former Western imperialists I mean not former imperialists I'm former imperial countries. Firstly, I, I don't think China gave I mean thought of the Belt, Belt and Road Initiative and gave uh, this thing to only because it wanted to make RMB into you know uh, the dominant currency. There were there were. <laughs> Broadly, two reasons, I think, besides that, that, that mattered, but no, it was not the principal reason. One, of course, given the rate of growth which China was 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 sustaining at a, at a certain point of time, but particularly the early 2000s, the late 1990s, early 2000s, that it, its demand for raw materials, etc., were such that it had to actually build access. So a lot of the ports and roads and so on it built was actually to be able to move things from the mines or the fields to the ports so that it could get access to them. It was part of its agenda of trying to be able to get strategic control of resources as part of. The second reason why it, yeah, I think it did it was for straightforward strategic purposes. I mean, if it was doing, if it's doing the corridor in Pakistan, of course, one is it give, gives it a port. You know, but, it, but, but yeah, exactly. But it also it also gives it a, a, a strategic position in 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 the region. So you know, um, I don't know. Maybe Humban Tota Port was also done for the same reason. I mean, you know. Uh, now, while while admitting that these, of course, are national interests of China, this is not altruism. But that that's how that's how the world has always functioned. In fact, you know. Um, Tandika Makandwere, who, you know, this famous African economist whom Erinch and, and so on know, know well as, as well as I do, and unfortunately he's no more, used to say that, listen, I mean, you know, you go and talk to an African leader and say that, oh, is, is, is you know, is China, you know, giving you money, which is a danger. He says, listen, I mean, he said the response you'll get to say is, is that okay? I mean, I, I you know, I know I, I have a danger from France and they don't give me money. So bring China on. I'll take both China and China, but they give me give me some money. They give me some investments, you know. So so the whole thing is, you know, I mean, it's not that China is not doing this in national interest. Finally, China is one. I think if you do a search in the Financial Times, just last week also there was a report of uh, you know based on you know, on one of the consultancy firms that the country which has actually restructured debt bilaterally on terms which are extremely good for borrowers is China. And it does it for the same reasons. It still wants a position vis-a-vis -vis raw materials, including, of course, raw materials, which are going to be crucial in the next stage of, 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 of international competition, you know, rare, rare earth materials, etc. And two, it wants a strategic position. Now, to that, you might be able to add the fact that it also wants to strengthen the RMB. So I, so I, you know, I mean, I, we are not we are not in the world, you know, we are not in the world in which we think that the common turn is going to bring revolution in all countries. That's not the world we are in. This every, all nations are doing it for their interest. But all we are saying is that when developing countries look at the options that they have, 
maybe today China is a much better option than a set of countries which don't want to dominate them, but are not willing to put their money where their power is. You know? As I as I remember, uh, two weeks ago, uh, India declared uh, using of rupee with uh, 18 countries uh, mm. for trade. Uh, due to this reason, uh, a new topic in the world uh, media, uh, declining uh, US dollar and uh, rising of alternative this currency. Is all, this is all wishful thinking. <laughs> you know? That is wishful thinking. The, the, the American hegemony and imperialism is not going to disappear so easily. <laughs> Professor, nevertheless, uh, I am not sure about that since the deafness of uh, U.S. market, U.S. financial markets is so uh, deep. Uh, as I know, uh, and uh, there is no alternative uh, against uh, U.S. Uh, financial markets uh, that. Am I wrong? Uh, currently, yeah, true. Uh, But I mean, you know, it, it, the, 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 you know, given given the fact that the only the only constant is change. Mm -hmm. This too would change. We, we only don't know when it's going to change. Correct. Uh, Absolutely. However, um, the US dollar is still the leading currency. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as you said, um, if you look at the history, what happened to the other leading currencies in the past cycles, if you like, uh, th those uh, do not lose their uh, reserve currency status uh, mm -hmm. just like that. It takes a while, and that while is about 20, 30 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it's going to happen to, to the US dollar as well, but it's not going to happen next year. It will take a lot. That's, I believe, what you also uh, think, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the, U, the US dollar is still the uh, yeah. dominate. Yeah. I don't take all of these things uh, wow, the, the, the yuan is coming and the other currencies are coming and the dollar is dying and all that. Uh, it's too early for that. It will take maybe another decade or two yeah. for that to happen. It in seems my so. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Kerem wanted to ask a question if I'm not wrong. Um. Yeah, I think you can hear me. Um. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, and again, uh, uh, very nice to meet you. And uh, um, I mean, the, um, I mean, even for I mean, uh, once we are uh, uh, discussing today's uh, uh, um, developing country debt problems, and even I mean, which has like, like begun. I mean, actually with Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, and then uh, uh, yeah, we will see. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, whoever will I mean. I mean the next ones um but um i wonder i mean like whether i mean i mean today's like problems are i mean mostly legacies of previous policies and one thing is this enabling a uh, global financial architecture uh, uh especially which is i mean which owes to i mean liberalization policies I mean, in, I mean, like a decades, I mean, before today, we know it. Uh, the second is that probably this management of global financial crisis in 2008 and onwards, uh, I mean, was also, I think, one of the, the issues. I mean, probably just uh, pouring money into the financial system rather than helping uh, those, I mean, households, for example, in the EU, in the in the say in the eurozone or in or in the us uh, there was a i mean this discussion between helicopter money and i mean uh, uh, bailing and uh, bailing out i mean uh, uh, the uh, financial sector at that time and then all this money i mean at some point i mean we have i mean uh, 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 stimulated growth in the uh, developing world through the financial channel rather than trade channel Uh, for example, I mean, if they were to save households and, I mean, just I mean, revive uh, aggregate demand uh, rather than, I mean, uh, bailing out the, uh, uh, the, the financial system in the center, uh, then, I mean, I mean, perhaps, I mean, demand in the center could have, I mean, uh, also triggered 
more production and perhaps I mean also to help with uh, 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 stimulating the productive like the forces in the periphery. Uh, so rather than earning hard currency through financial flows, I mean manufacturing might have. So I mean there was also some sort of an international uh, uh, disconnect or I mean some uh, um, I mean again this political economy of and these like and these decisions made at that time in the center. Now, I mean, we are observing probably again this, I mean, so another uh, interest rate hike cycle in the center. So, uh, so this enabling global financial architecture, then the crisis in the uh, center responds to it. Now, after, I mean, almost, a, I mean, two, I mean, one and a half decades, now we are here, probably. So this uh, uncoordinated crisis response and not managing this, uh, uh, or at least, I mean, I mean, it was a crisis moment. There could have been, say, uh, 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 um, probably even, I mean, say, um, to some extent, de-liberalize this uh, global financial infrastructure so as to, I mean, uh, uh, um, fight against financial leakages. So I, at that time, I had like imagined this. I mean, this is a pool. We are pouring new water, which is actually, I mean, dirty, but just to make it, I mean, uh, appear as, I mean, clean and, I mean, which, like, in which we can still in, perhaps. But, the, but I mean, there was also a leakage at that time. So even if you were like say like pouring like like water into the into the pool, there was also a leakage I mean, towards the the periphery. So we so without even managing this pool and structure and filling these I mean the holes and these le leakages, uh, there was also I mean I mean some like a problems. I mean we are observing the legacies of decisions made at that time. Probably. I mean, this is not a, like a question, but some sort of a, like reflection. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I had you know, the... yeah. I I just I just want to say, you know, I completely. I mean, of course, I that was. I mean, I was also trying to make this argument that that the a whole set of legacies generated the situation. But you know, I okay. I mean, you know, in some sense, we are in a trap because you know, we have to we have to think of ways in which we can try and get better resolution. But, but the 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 fundamental problem, I mean, so so the way we try to po pose it is that you know that these are erroneous policies, you know, this unconventional monetary policies adopted by central banks, uh, you know, the priv the privileging of monetary policy or fiscal policy, etc. But there is there is a fundamental, you know, which which in this community I I, I can raise, which is and that 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 fundamental problem is that you see, the the. The, the period of the, the golden age was an exceptional period in history of capitalism when you had, you know, significant growth. And I'm talking about in the metropolitan core, low inflation and near full employment. Now, basically, I mean, and, and everybody attributed this to Keynesianism. But what actually became clear is that the nature of capitalism at its core is that you cannot sustain this. You cannot have a situation where you're near full employment and workers therefore become strong, as Kaleski had pointed out many years back, and have a you know, low inflation and have uh, relatively high growth. <coughs> and so really, we, are, we, are, we, are, you know, we can identify policies as wrong, but it's really the search of the, of the capitalist core for ways in which the um, the assertion of the deep internal contradictions of capitalism has made impossible what at one period people took for granted and said that i mean now we've resolved the problem we're not going to have a great depression ever again <clears throat> okay um uh, it's about nine or yeah. nine. Uh, are you tired chandra well, if you, I mean, I can take a couple of questions if you would like to. Okay, I believe Gali Pialman is going to ask a question. I'm sorry, uh, Chandra, uh, I don't know if you recall, maybe we had 
Yeah, of course, several back many years together. back. Of course, I do. Yes, of course, I do. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I missed. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no. Your, your presentation, but a couple of weeks ago, I listened to one of the ideas uh, webinars uh, on Zambia and Sri Lanka, and joined by your dear friend Jayati Ghosh as well among the participants. Yeah. And in that respect, there was this uh, comment made that not only, as you already said, the international context changed, but also uh, the composition of the creditor community yeah. compared to the say from the mid seventies to the late eighties, because of this importance of this <clears throat> bond market creditors. So what, in what respect do you think um, it makes a qualitative difference in terms of characterizing the nature of the debt crisis, as well as in terms of potential ways out of it, from the point of view of the indebted economies? No, in, 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 in fact, I, I, that was one of the points I focused on in my presentation, basically sorry, saying- Sorry, I missed it. No, 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 it. that's okay. But, but I, I, I do think that, uh, you know, why do we have so there are there are two kinds of changes in, as far as the credit community is concerned mm -hmm. one is or three kinds of changes one is that the share of private flows which has been which has been true for a considerable period of time the share of private flows re relative to official flows has increased quite significantly over a period of time mm -hmm. two to the extent that there are creditor flows in some countries i mean i mean I'm sorry official flows still and in some countries it's it, it can be significant there's been a change in the composition of creditor flows within the official flows with China becoming this most significant creditor. And finally, of course, within the, the private credit, what which used to be dominated by commercial banks, now you actually have a significant, to a significant degree the emergence of other kinds of private financial institutions, but more importantly, private bondholders. Okay, some of some of whom are investment funds, etc. I mean, it does it, yeah. there are a few individuals, but a lot of them are really, you know, asset managers and investment funds and so on and so forth, who are who are holders of, 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 of bonds. Now, what I was trying to suggest is that this this change is also because of, of the fact that you created an environment where you could engage in the carry trade, you know, you borrowed cheap at near zero interest rates. And you lend to developing countries where your interest rates were much higher. We're talking about 8%, 10%, 12%. So the reason why you had all of these people rushing into the into a, into a set of markets, which before the 1980s were considered to be too risky, is because of the fact that, I mean, you, you almost saw it as, you know, a an, 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 an no-lose situation where you're getting money for nothing. It's near zero interest rates. And you're going to get this high so that, you know, even if you make a few losses in one location, overall, you're going to make a significant degree of gain, you know. So so it's, it's that change in the creditor community on the private side is partly because of the change in the environment, which, as was pointed out, was because of things like uh, the decision after 2008 to use unconventional monetary policies as a way of trying to save the banking system uh, in the metropolitan core. And of course, after COVID, that the principal response to the COVID, where what the IMF calls, even in the developed countries, even in the US, where there was significant fiscal policy response, there was what, what are called under the line measures, you know, which were basically monetary measures to try and revive the economy. So, uh, yeah, you're right. It's, there was this significant change. And that, I was arguing, make, is what makes it extremely difficult in the current context, because then the battle for who carries the burden in terms of the relative burden, everybody has to take a haircut, mm -hmm. but you're really you're really fighting over the relative burden, and the whole push of the of 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 of, of uh, advanced economy governments and of course the Bretton Woods institutions is to work out strategies in which the burden which is going to be carried by the private creditors is going to be much less, and this is not new. I mean that's what Brady Bonds was trying to do. Yeah. Brady Bonds was using using Treasury and 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 Fed to give money to these countries in the form of bonds which they could buy and they use those bonds as collateral to reduce to, to get themselves a haircut but that was a reduced haircut because there was a restructuring effort so so always that has been there but that has increased hugely in the current context uh, thank you and one more thing 
uh, Sabri and Erinç, among others, were present last week in the uh, session. Uh, <coughs> Webinar uh, sessions, we uh, listened to Patrick Bond, who was arguing BRICS were part of the imperialist system, functioning as sub imperialists. And not that I agree necessarily, but I mean, uh, to what extent it is, I suppose. Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say the BRICS are, uh, you know radical anti neoliberal <laughs> radical anti neoliberal force in the current world economy mm. but the problem with patrick is his anger against the south african government converts itself into an anger against everything outside <laughs> outside of the working class in in south africa you know so you have to we, we have to realize that there you have to have a nuanced view of the international system mm -hmm. in which uh, voices like this are are voices which are not going to you know not going to help you win the battle against neoliberalism but are important uh, indicators of the way of the interstices in the in the geopolitical environment which can which can be exploited yeah mm. okay um yeah it's about 9.16. One last thing I would like to ask. Uh, it's a very short question. What happens? Some of these countries says we are not servicing our debts. Why don't they do this? Yeah, so the point is, you know, I think that the only, the only way that you can actually have a resolution of some significance is if you, if you have a coalition of debtor countries. You know, if, if each country goes and, you know, negotiates, you'll, you'll take the IMF, the IMF will become, you know, whereas if you have a coalition of debtor countries, which then says that, listen, here is our de template. Here is our template as debtor countries, because otherwise we're just going to, you know, we're not going to be able to, we're going to default. We don't wow. believe that what you're going to do. But the point is, unless you form, you know, what, what do we want to call it? A debtor's cartel, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> unless that happens. But yeah. uh, that depends upon... And that depends upon the ability to be able to generate coalitions independent of the core. Yes. B20 is not a coalition independent of the core. Yeah. And, 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 and the poorest countries, it is true, do not trust the BRICS. I mean, they trust China maybe more than they trust the rest of the BRICS, you know, some of them. So to create those coalitions is a difficult thing. But, uh, but yeah, this is a talk which is in the air. That listen, Absolutely. finally, you have to have your own template. What was his name? Uh, the, the former prime minister of Pakistan. Uh, what was, I, I don't remember him. Musharraf. Hmm? No, no, no. Bhutto. No, 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 no the, 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 the recent one. Imran Khan. Imran Khan. Imran Khan. He called for a coalition a few years ago. Uh, maybe before COVID, if I am not wrong. What happened to that call? Uh, firstly, you, you, firstly, they threw him out. I mean, <laughs> you know, the problem in you know with Imran is that he partly came to power because of the military, and mm -hmm. then he fell out of the military, and so it just as complicated the politics of Sri Lanka. I'm sorry, Pakistan too much. You know. Yeah, but the rest of the world did not follow his lead. In other words, like right? yeah, they didn't. No, there have been others. I mean, in, in, I suppose in some sense, you know, I mean, like for example, if you take the um, uh, the um, uh, the Barbados, uh, what's the what initiative is that? Uh, Bridgetown initiative. I mean, you know, it's actually a call for a coalition of the developed and the developing. That's that's not going to help. Finally, you know, if it's going, you're going to have a debt resolution. It has to be a coalition of the debtors who that you know actually you know an example of this is when uh, Argentina. You know, the, the second you know government came back to Argentina, and I think. Um, who was it? I think it was Martin Guzman, uh, who was the, mm -hmm. uh, the yes. France minister. Yes. They actually said, told the IMF that, listen, here's our, our debt DSA, what we think has to be the debt sustainability initiative. And uh, then the, the uh, IMF told, some report, supposedly told him that, but yeah, what is this? How can you have a DSA? Where's the program? So he said, I'll give you the program. He said, I'm a member nation of the IMF, and I'm going to give you my program and my DSA. And you give me your comments, because based on that comments, I will think about mine and then present it to the, the to the creditor community. I'm not going to make you draft for me my DSA and my program. I will draft my DSA and my program. What is DSA, by the way? Debt sus sustainability assessment. It it 
it actually tells you how much you have to reduce the net present value of of debt and the way in which you're going to do it in terms of the so Argentina was saying that we will do the assessment ourselves yeah we we we'll tell you what the trajectory has to be what the haircut has to be you know uh -huh. then they said why what's the program they said we'll give you the program okay uh it's 9:20 um i guess uh, we should go the end uh Okay, go ahead. Uh, Professor, can I ask a question uh, specific to India? Yeah. Uh, today, according to UN projections, uh, India's population surpassed uh, China's population. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, in terms of uh, economic dynamism uh, versus uh, Malt Malthusian uh, trap, Uh, how can we interpret uh, this development? So there is no Malthusian trap. I mean, you know, every mouth to feed, as we always say, come the two hands. But the point is, you have to you have to educate. You know, you might have a young population, but you have to educate them. You have to give the get them jobs. So you have to have a whole trajectory and policy which uses the fact that you have a young population. India, so called, everybody talks about the demographic dividend. There's no dividend at the moment because basically it's it's become a demographic burden because you don't have the policies to be able to generate for them the 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 give them the education, the skills, and give them the employment, which will make them more productive uh, workers and therefore allow you to compete internationally. Yeah. Uh, some scholars uh, began to claim that uh, due to Uh, population dynamism, uh, India's economy uh, would uh, surpass uh, China's economy in periods. There, there uh, is no, there is, you, if, if you read those people, you'll find that there is they have no argument. Hmm. That's just an assertion. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Oh, thanks for having me. A nice meeting, all of y'all. Likewise. <laughs> All the best. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.